In this session, we will discuss the 2012 paper for the IAS Mains Geography Optional. Uh, we will be covering the section B of paper 1. We have already covered section A. Now, as we have seen in section A, most of the questions were direct. Just it was that the uh, language of the question was tilted to confuse. Uh, similar was the case in section B. Most of the question asked about direct concepts or direct theories. Just the language of the question was a bit tricky. Now the first question talks about relevance of distance decay principle in Indian cities. Now again this question directly asks about the concept of distance decay which says as you move away from the city center as the distance increases the effect decreases. So basically it follows the distance decay rule and uh, if uh, the population is maximum at the core and it decreases as you move away from the city you can say uh, it is applicable in most of the Indian cities like uh, most of the metropolitans you have main CBD or the central business uh, district as the hub of the trade and uh, it basically focuses on the three stage the first is the metropolitan dominance which shows the main area or the main metropolitan area. The next is metropolitan prominence which shows the prominent presence of metropolitan in the region and finally is a metropolitan association that's the city fringe that is also known as the city region or the city fringe region which is towards the outer boundary. So I can say the center region would be metropolitan dominance then you have prominence and finally the region of association so these three stages basically fall under the uh, huge uh, uh, huge concept of the distance decay principle where we try to understand how the things change as you move away from the city center so uh, this was a direct question most of the answers would be direct here the next question is impact of migration on urban demography. Now when you are answering this question there are two things you need to focus on. First is rural to urban migration and next is urban to urban migration. When I say rural to urban migration it's important that I explain both the rural impacts and the urban impacts and when I say urban to urban migration it's a movement from a smaller urban town to a urban metropolitan. So when I say movement from rural to urban, what are the benefits and drawbacks on both the ends? So when I say for the rural region, I can say there would be decrease in farming activities because most of the people are moving out of the rural areas. This would lead to food insecurity. So this is on the side of rural areas. However, on the side of urban areas, you will definitely have more labor force. You will have advantages of people moving in to the urban areas but this again will have certain drawbacks. This can be in the form of child labor practices. So in the urban areas you might see increased cases of child labor. Then you would have problems related to overcrowding, lack of sanitation and hygiene facilities and then you would have ultimately you would have problems related to slum development or uh, slum formations. So what you have to mention in this question is the impact of migration. So you have to explain the trend, how the movement, the various types of migration uh, focusing mainly on the rural to urban and urban to urban migration, how urban metropolitan can handle a specific amount of uh, individuals and if that exceeds it would create pressure on the city which would lead to problems of overcrowding and uh, sanitation. The next is Similarities in the population distribution of southern continents and the reason for the same. Now when we say northern continents and the southern continents, more than 90% of the population lies in the northern hemisphere. However, southern hemisphere has certain similarities. So if you, uh, if in questions like this, if you draw a quick map to explain the concepts, you can explain those very well explaining how in the southern hemisphere you would have this is a rough map that I have drawn so you can explain how there are similarities in the grasslands that are found the downs of Australia and then the pampas of South America so you have similarities in the grasslands then you have similarities in the desert so you have the desert regions which are similar so 
you can chalk out the similarities in the southern hemisphere and explain how there is a population variation that takes place. So this is again a question where you can put in some stats and explain how the things vary and uh, it's primarily the, uh, the grassland regions where you will have the livestock activities and the animal rearing activities that would happen. The next is the status of infant mortality rate in the world. Now the best thing here is to compare the African region versus the European region or I could say the underdeveloped regions or the developing less developed countries versus the uh, developed countries that would be more better to explain. So uh, in African nations you have an IMR of 55 per thousand in contrast to European regions where it is just 10 per thousand. Now the infant mortality rate is the death of child under the age of 5. However, 4.5 million of the deaths occur just within one year in less than one year of the childhood. So less than one year is the main focus here where you are trying to explain this and the status of infant mortality in the world you need to explain why there are regional disparities that occur why certain regions have certain low uh, such a low infant mortality as compared to other regions so you have to explain that in detail and also explain the uh, scenario which says how the IMR has decreased from uh, nearly 63 worldwide to 32 now. So uh, problems faced by industry which are developed due to inertia. When I say industrial inertia, it's first you need to explain the meaning of industrial inertia. Industrial inertia in very simple terms can be explained as like if you have an industry which was preferred to run on a location which was formerly a source of uh, some raw material or something which now is no more there. Okay, so the basic source because of which the industry was established there now does not exist. So that is how you have industrial inertia but still you have industries coming up. For example, I can say the mining areas of Odisha and Jharkhand, you have huge amount of mining activities because of which numerous industries started developing there and now the mining if I say is exhausted, despite of the exhaustion of mining activities there, there are still development activities or industries that are coming up into the region. So when such thing happens, what would happen? That would have a huge cost that would that the industry would have to bear and uh, the examples you can chalk out from the examples of Odisha and Jharkhand that I mentioned and this would lead to definitely problems and the management of those problems would be difficult because the industry is now established there and is facing problems might be related to raw material or transportation and because of which the cost of production increases. Once the cost of production increases, the industry does not remain viable. So if the industry is not viable, there could be a forced closure or a shutdown of an industry. So these are some of the problems that are faced due to inertia. So here you have to explain the same concept. The next is evaluate the various models on population density distribution in urban centers. Now this is a classic question that tries to, uh, tries to extract from you that you know what is Clark's model. So Clark's model basically talked about the urban centers and the population density distribution. It talked uh, as you move away from the periphery uh, from the center or the CBD the density of population decreases. So it decreases exponentially as you move away from the city center. So that was what was Clark's model. Later on Muth and Mill uh, elaborated on this model and tried to explain the similar patterns in population distribution and the density of population varies as you move away from the city center. The next question is although 70% of the Indian population is rural, urban planning is crucial for the development of India. Now to answer this question, first of all you need to explain why urban areas are engines of growth. So you have to explain the urban areas are the uh, pioneer centers for growth. Also there is lot of migration activity that takes place from rural to urban areas. And then you need to move forward and explain that because of the improper planning and certain uh, restrictions that you can say that can be due to political commitment, that can be due to social causes. These all uh, drawbacks hamper the planning process. Despite of these, you have the urban centers as the main focus for the growth centers because uh, they kind of uh, give forward an integrated approach 
which talks about uh, more about a kind of natural system and its interaction with the uh, land management practices. The next is salient features of watershed planning, its advantages and disadvantages. Now this we have covered in detail in the video, so you can refer that. And then again you must definitely cite examples, few of those which we have covered in the video, which explains how watershed planning has been remarkable in certain areas and if uh, like watershed management is applied to other areas, how can it uh, bring prosperity to those regions. The next question is impact of changing fertility ratio on world population distribution. Now this question is typically meant to confuse you or to help understand whether a student is familiar with the concept of demographic transition. So rather than asking, uh, asking a question directly on what is demographic transition model, this question has been tilted to, uh, twisted to ask about the changing fertility ratio. So under the demographic transition four stages, you try to understand how the activity takes place and you have the four stages which we try to explain with the first stage where you have uh, the birth rate and the death rate at the same stage and then you have the fertility rate that increases drastically and uh, then you have the control on the fertility rate and as well as the death rate. So you have to explain the demographic transition model and the various stages of demographic transition model under this and explain how uh, under, under the four different stages you have the fertility ratio that impacts the overall growth of population. The next, this question again is a kind of direct question which aims to understand the concept, which aims that you know the concept of pre-made city. So what is asked here is colonial forces resulted in the pre-made city pattern of urban processes in most of the Southeast Asian countries. Now when colonial expansion took place, what, what happened was they took out a place which was either close to the uh, coastal area was good for transportation or where you could have a good population settlement that could be established. As a result, there was in the city, uh, in the country, there was one or two major centers that were picked up and those started to develop in and out. So you have a kind of primate city model that exists in say uh, Bangkok. Then you have Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. So these Bangkok in Thailand. So these are some of the examples which where you have development or growth in the form of a uh, primate city model. And here what you have to explain is mainly the primate city model and the causes of growth which are mainly related to the colonial forces. The next question is the regional shift in the world urbanization after 1950s and the varied characteristics of urban processes. Now if you look onto this graph carefully you would see there had been a sharp increase in the urbanization pattern starting 1950s onward. Till 1950s the graph was more or less stagnant but since 1950 to 2050 what is projected is that from 30% the urban population would hike up to 70%. So you would have, you, would, you are seeing a kind of huge regional shift in the urban population and that too you have to explain the regional shift. That means Certain areas you have more uh, concept of urbanization that is being starting up. For example, 93% of the urbanization is taking place in the developing nations. Out of this 93%, 80% is uh, counted only for Asia and Africa. So you have huge proportion of urbanization that is going on in the developing and the less developed nations. And here what you need to explain is how the population pattern is increasing or there has been a more, more uh, uh, predominant focus on the process of urbanization. The next is impact of failure of monsoon on Gujarat agroclimatic conditions or the agroclimatic zone. Now when we talk about Gujarat or any other region, what would be the main drawbacks that you would have if you have a region which is uh, where you have a kind of failure of monsoon. Now specifically if we talk about Gujarat, you would have uh, most of the region here is kind of uh, seasonal fed rivers. Since the rivers are seasonally fed, it would lead to uh, kind of drought conditions in the area. There would be acute water shortage. Uh, there could be problems related to food insecurity. Then there would be deficiency of the nitrogen, potassium and the key fertilizers that should be present in the soil. Also, this would lead to increase in soil salinity. 
So these are uh, alkalization of soil. So these are some of the major drawbacks that the region would face because of the uh, failure of monsoon in a specific region and predominantly in Gujarat. As a result, here you can also mention the Sony project that has been launched recently which aims to connect the feeder waters from Narda to the, uh, to the seasonal rivers of the, uh, the Kathiawad region of Gujarat. The next question is, Locational significance of Rotterdam in Europe, uh, European economy. Now this question if you say won't uh, most of you say that this is out of syllabus or something like that but this is in uh, in a way directly linked to the syllabus because you have the section on transportation where you uh, talk about the business routes and Rotterdam is one of the largest or I could say busiest ports of Europe. It is also known as gateway of Europe. It is one of the major cargo handlers for Europe and nearly I would say most likely the third largest uh, cargo handler around the world. So it definitely has a major impact on the economy of Europe. Uh, it also connects, it creates a delta and a channel there. So you have a kind of uh, significance which is for both the perspective, the natural as well as the economic significance. So here what you need to emphasize is basically the, just the economic significance. So with this we cover uh, the paper 1 completely for 2012. We will be covering paper 2 in a separate session. Uh, we will be following uh, these series of lectures with 2013, 14 and 15 papers uh, which will be forthcoming in the next videos. Have a good day.